Hello, it's Duncan. We continue our exploration of the checkout carter with a look at the relationship between functions and data. Normally, data in our software represents the state of things, but can also be used to parameterize behavior, as we'll see when we refactor from functions to classes. And you may or may not be screaming at the screen now. This is where we left the checkout carter last time. We have the tests on the left and the production code on the right. And the checkout works by applying a list of price rules. When you scan, it adds the code to the list of codes, and then it updates the total by asking every price rule what it thinks the price should be, given this set of codes, and then sums those up. So a price rule is something that takes a list of strings, the codes that we scanned, and returns a price. And we get one of those for our discounted prices by calling this function, we call it here in the tests, that takes a code, and then how much discount we get if we buy a certain number. So here, A is cost 50, but if you buy three, you get a discount of 20. And by calling this function, we return a price rule, which is itself a function. So this is a higher order function. It returns this lambda here that takes the code so that we can see if we were to ask its type is the list of string. Now, in some ways, we've restricted our pricing strategy to that that can be expressed as a list of price rules. We might want to get more complicated than that. One price rule might need to know about the existence of another price rule, that sort of thing. But for now, it will do because what I want to go on and look at is that at the moment, something has to build this list of price rules, and we do it here in code. Discounted price rule, discounted price rule, discounted price rule. The Carter, though, here it is, let's look down, specifies our pricing rules as this table. It's a list of lines. So my question is, could we build a checkout given these lists of lines? I'll copy it from here, rather than a programmer having to write code like this. Well, we're programmers, we can do anything, but let's just make a private val rules as string and put that in there. Once upon a time, parsing this into invocations of a function like this would have been just tedious. There will be loops and regular expressions and if matches and maths as well, because this is three for 130, not 20 and three. So can someone else do it? And of course the answer is yes. Let's ask Junie. And I'm going to say, write a function to parse rules as string into list of price rule. Well, maybe that's enough. Let's have a look. Well, it claims to be done. Thank you, Junie. Let's have a look and see what we got. All right, then it's changed our tests and it's removed the hard coded rules that we had and replaced it with parse rules and rules of string. And parse rules and rules of string is over here. And my goodness, as I predicted, that is a lot of code that would have taken me a while. But I don't know whether you saw, it ran the tests. And they passed. Has it done a fantastic job? Well, I'm not sure this is what I would have written, but it does pass the tests. I sort of wish it had tidied up. Let's inline that one and move it up maybe. Still good. Still good. And you know, I'm really not convinced that we need to trim or filter is not blank because the regex will do that. And in that case, I don't really need the line sequence. And then I don't need to do the to list at the end. Oh, oh, I'm an idiot. I still need to get the lines, but this is now just lines. Map not null and don't need to do the to list. Splendid. Now, I think if this is a production code, we might want to put in different variations of this table with and without indents, maybe tabs rather than spaces, that sort of thing, to check that this parsing actually works. But we have the problem now that we can only actually test this parsing by seeing the effects of the functions it returns in the checkout. That is, say we're building this set of rules here, and we're using those in these tests because this price function that all the tests call uses the rules. It would be much better if we could compare the list of rules we got by parsing this string against the list that we had here previously. Let's just find that, there it is. I'm going to take that and restore it. And I think we could say then that this is our expected rules. If we had that then, we could write another test. So we could say at test fun parser rules. And actually the AI has written the right code there. What it's saying is, look, you've got these expected rules and you've got the rules here that you've got by parsing the rules of string. So are they the same? Well, that's an interesting question. Let's run it and find out. And no, they aren't. Why is that? Well, the clue is here. We expected a list with 
basically a bunch of lambdas in it, and we got a list with basically a bunch of lambdas in it. Those lambdas are the lambdas that are returned by this discounted price rule, things like this. But for functions, Kotlin has no idea whether they're the same, except by running them. So we have this problem that expressing pricing in terms of these functions was really simple. It feels like it cuts to the essence of the problem, but it's hard to test. Now, pure functions are easier to test than impure functions, the ones with side effects, the ones we call actions, but, as we're discovering here, they're not as easy to test as data. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn our functions into data. Note that they're already pretty close to data, because we create them from data. We create them from A5033, or code, base price, discount amount, discount per. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a class that contains the data that was used to create the rule. So that's class and it's discounted price rule. Now you can see the AI has taken the hint. It's basically said, well, you've kind of got that thing down here. So tab here, well, it's close. I think we can just return base price minus discount. So what have we got? Well, we've got a class that is itself a price rule. It implements this function type, which is something that takes a list of string and returns an int, and it implements it with the same algorithm as we have down here in our function, the one that returns a lambda. So given that, I think this discounted price rule function, the one we're calling everywhere, could return the discounted price rule object like that, because this lambda is the same as this invoke. Is that true? Ah, we were refactoring on a broken test, weren't we? Everything's passed now, except for the parse rules that was broken before. And you can see the error message here is that it expected a bunch of discounted price rules rather than those odd lambdas before. And you may or may not be screaming at the screen now and saying, Duncan, you could fix that if only you made this a data class. Because if you did, two discounted price rules with the same fields would be equal. Aha! So now we have the same expression of our checkout in terms of price rules, but we have the convenience of data when it comes to deciding whether two price rules are the same or not. By the way, it's worth saying that the code that was here before, that's this lambda, I'll put it back just so we can see. To build this lambda, the thing the compiler will build to implement price rule when you call this function will look an awful lot like this discounted price rule here. It will be a little object that remembers these parameters so that when you call this with some codes, it can use the parameters in here. It's just that object is anonymous and isn't a data class. So let's go back to there and check everything is fine. And now we've made that change. I think we'll go to this test and we will say convert to block body. And I think now all these prices should use these rules here, but this rule should be this list. So I'm going to take that and put it into there. And now these expected rules are string and cut out of there, and they're just things that are important to this parse rules here. And that should be parse rules, given the rules of the string. Now, all of our tests of the checkout are using this explicit set of rules here, but parse rules can now have different variations of this to see whether they pass correctly. And we're finally now, I don't think this function is pulling its weight. I think we can just inline that. That makes it go away. I think we can get rid of that. And now in all these places, we're creating discount price rules. The same should be true in here. And we are good. There are certainly some people who wouldn't have made that last refactor. They would have allowed this discounted price rule to be private within checkout and keep the factory function. That would allow us, if we were maintaining the checkout, to change the name of this or its structure or anything we like without breaking any of our clients. But at the moment, at least I own both sides of the screen, and I think the simplicity of having a class is worth keeping. So I hope you've enjoyed this exploration of the relationship between functions and data. Of course, not all data is used to build functions. Sometimes it's measurements or predictions about the world, but very often it is used, as it is here, to allow us to configure the way that our code works at runtime. As well as the testability, the important thing to us about this parse rules function is that we've gone from code where if we had different rules, we need a programmer to write this list like this, to code where if we have different rules, we just have to get a user to write a table like this. As a software team, we don't want it to be our weekly job to write a set of rules. Now it doesn't have to be because we can pass this string. 
There's just one problem left, really, and that's that, in my experience, normal people are pretty bad at making consistent formats of this thing. You can pretty much guarantee that somebody will come along and write 20 discount per 3, expect it to work, and it won't. Can we fix that? Do you know what a rhetorical question is? Either way, like and subscribe to see the next episode where we'll give it a go. Thanks for watching. Oh, and don't forget to buy my book.